solutions. And we're not just talking about being able to solve crime faster. You're talking about possibly interdicting, actually responding to an incident in real time. And think about it. You're listening to Peachtree Corners Live, a podcast sharing ideas, opinions, and news about the city of Peachtree Corners, the community we live in, and the people that are your neighbors. Now, your host, Rico Figliolini. Hi, everyone. This is Rico Figliolini, host of Peachtree Corners Life and several other podcasts that covers the city of Peachtree Corners. We have a great show today that we're going to be talking with Chris Lindenau, the CEO of FUSIS, which is actually based in Peachtree Corners. Hey, Chris, how are you? Hello, Rico. Thanks for having me on. Sure, absolutely. Before we get into the show, I just want to introduce our sponsor, which is EV Remodeling. They've been a corporate sponsor of ours for the past few months, and they've been supporting our journalism, not only on these podcasts, but through the magazines that we publish. So you can reach out to them. They've been a great supporter of ours. They are also based in Peachtree Corners. So speak to Eli, who's the owner at EV Remodeling Inc. And you can find that at evremodelinginc.com. So let's get right into it. Technology has advanced so much as far as the last few years. And we've gone from, you know, having a ring on the door, on the front door, just to see if that UPS package came or if it's been taken, but nothing else to be able to do with it. Some people say, well, you know, some of this technology is really not helpful, except that it shows maybe in the post event of what happened that, Maybe some crime occurred. And maybe sometimes it can be used to find someone. But in the move from going from ring and smart devices that's out there to a bigger drive of not just private and commercial safety, but community safety, there's been a big void, right? I mean, you have ring, you have a bunch of other devices out there. And even when I look at my home and say, well, I can have several different devices, they're not all talking to each other. Right. You've sort of solved that, right, Chris? I mean, yep. your background is military. I mean, it's a great background to have coming into this. So, in mm-hmm. fact, let me take a step back. Yeah, Give me a, a short two-minute bio, if you will, of your background and your experience, and then we'll jump right into the rest of it. Sure. Former military officer, graduated from the Naval Academy. Like so many you know, military personnel kind of transitioning into the private sector, you kind of think about what's next. Ours kind of had an affinity for technology. It was always something that I enjoyed. So I decided to get into the manufacturing sector pretty early on in my private sector career, first with Panasonic, and then eventually transitioned to a large space and defense manufacturer called Moog, building a lot of things for, you know, the likes of General Dynamics and Raytheon. And then subsequent to that, I actually, for the first time in my career, got involved in public safety with a company called Utility that was building among other things, body cameras and in-car video systems for law enforcement. And so if you look at where we are now in the company that I founded back in June of 2019, it was really an amalgamation of all these different skill sets that I've kind of picked up, not only in my private sector career, but also prior to that, my military career. Just a lot of background in safety and crime and helping certain agencies like that. And and you're right, I, I have a lot of friends that have been on the police force and military, and it's amazing where they've gone when they've gotten out of that. So your company provides what's being called real-time crime center in the cloud, right? It's working not only across the country with California agencies, transforming Mm -hmm. the way they operate within their communities, providing safety to the communities that they represent, and building stronger relationships, it seems, between the businesses and citizens within those communities. That's right. right. But you're also in Peachtree Corners, and you're based in Peachtree Corners. And just recently, the city actually signed a contract with FUSIS to be able to do some stuff here in the city. So can you sort of explain a little bit about what that agreement entails and where we are with that? Yeah, sure. So, you know, the Real-Time Crime Center and the cloud platform is really a public-private partnership platform. It allows law enforcement agencies like Gwinnett County PD here in the West Precinct, which covers Peachtree Corners, which is obviously where our headquarters is, and that's where the contract is that you're referring to, our city here in Peachtree Corners. What it allows them to do is basically aggregate data sets throughout the community. And this is important for a number of reasons. First off, you look at law enforcement as a whole, you know, subsequent to the George Floyd incident in Minneapolis, which incidentally, we were the platform that they used during the protest movements and then subsequent to that leading up to the trial. 
the old approach to just kind of putting police officers out on the street and having a kind of physical presence in cities that were faced with shortfalls in budgets. In the case of Minneapolis, they actually removed at the time $8 million from the police department's budget. And of course, with that, the resources for a lot of police officers in that city. So they were faced with an increased level of public safety need, but not the personnel resources necessary to address that need. And so that's where technology comes in. FUSIS for the city of Minneapolis, like we'll be doing here in Peachtree Corners, essentially builds a bridge to the private sector. So it allows the business community's video cameras, as an example, in public facing areas, areas where vehicular traffic may occur, parking lots, entryways to buildings, you know, areas of public domain. Those cameras oftentimes capture incidents and they can be life safety incidents, they can be mm-hmm. criminal activity. And I think, Rico, you've documented in prior podcasts some of the prior activities that have been captured by our friends over at GCPD and their hardworking officers. Well, that just expedites that process even further. So this contract that you're referring to is basically the phase one of that public-private partnership. So if I understand correctly, there's a program out there, I think it's called Connect Peachtree Corners, where essentially not only are you being able to wire, if you will, or to bring into the network or the cloud private companies and city cameras, but you're also looking to register citizens, home residents, cameras, rings, other cameras that might be outward facing to roads and stuff, voluntarily, where citizens like myself, if I have a ring or an outside camera or two, that I can actually volunteer to register to say, I have this here. If you need it and you're going to county police and something happened in this neighborhood, and you need that, they can literally know exactly where it is versus canvassing 100 homes to find out if any of them had a ring and if any of them were working. So that's truly part, I think, of expanding what you're doing, right? Being able to provide that. Yeah, and there's some nuance to it because what we're doing with connectpeachtreecorners.org, the platform, the website that we're going to use to basically enroll willing participants in this public private partnership is really targeted towards the business community. So, you know, in phase one, and at least for the foreseeable future, this is really not to bring homeowners ring doorbell cameras into the network. It's really more designed for Peachtree Parkway, Spalding, the businesses that kind of line those roads. And of course, on those businesses, on the front of the buildings, on the rear of those buildings are oftentimes, Mm -hmm. as we all know, cameras. And that's invaluable data for all sorts of situations that law enforcement might need to respond to. So that's really where we're focusing in concert with our friends with the city, the city manager and his staff and our friends over at GCPD is to really build a platform so that the business community can contribute in the live video streams. Now, there is also something called the registry, Rico, and this is what we're referring to. Right. And the registry is a free service that basically says, My name is Chris. I have three cameras. Here's my email address. Here's my phone number. And this is the name of my business. And that's a free service. And that's huge because that tells the investigators where they need to go if there is a incident in an area to ask for video evidence. Of course, what they do in the registry is they simply bulk request out to everybody in an area. If you can think of like just drawing a circle around an area and then Mm -hmm. they can send a digital request. And of course, it's completely voluntary, you know, in both cases, the registry and the live sharing of video for public facing cameras, we're only asking for people to share of their own volition, and they can remove themselves from the program at any time. So there's no unilateral access on the part of the agency. It's completely donor contributed and controlled by the donor. With the live feed, aside from the citizen part, then that's a registry. With the live feed, which includes private companies, commercial cameras, city public cameras. For example, Town Center has like maybe 80 cameras. There's a bunch of cameras going down Peachtree Parkway and other intersections. And there's even cameras the city is willing to pay and put out on outside streets like near subdivision and such. So all those would be live cameras that if Gwinnett Police had something going on, if there was a robbery, a burglary, a shooting, something somewhere, an abduction, that they can follow that track down a road, let's say, and they can literally pull up those videos? 
It's exactly right. And actually, the way you described it, Rico, is almost identical to the way that law enforcement uses video technology. I was with an agency the other day, and they used, through FUSIS, in an urban area, they tracked a homicide suspect as they went from camera to camera to camera. And then they followed that homicide suspect as they exited their vehicle into a business. And then through that business and the re request for video from that business, they were mm -hmm. able to identify the facial image of that suspect. And so having that video, if you will, chain of custody where you see where suspect has transited through an area is of extraordinary importance. And we're not just talking about being able to solve crime faster. You're talking about possibly interdicting, actually responding to an incident in real time. And if you think about in law enforcement, they talk about kind of that golden 48 hours, the first 48, as it's sometimes called, after a homicide occurs, you've got really the highest probability of capturing the suspect in that first 48. Well, let's talk about the first 48 minutes, right? right. Think about right. how much we can do in real time if information is shared appropriately, while, of course, also maintaining people's right to privacy. And that's the mm -hmm. other component of this, which is it's important to note that we're not talking about cameras inside people's living rooms or we're not talking about doorbell cameras facing off the side of someone's home facing a neighbor's home. We're really talking about major thoroughfares, parks, public areas, areas right. that are already under surveillance where the officer may in the past have to physically go to that location to acquire video. Now they have actually the ability to use that data in real time. So let's stay with that for a minute because I'm curious. I have a few quick questions regarding sure. that. So I'm in front of these screens, these monitors, and I see where I want to be but I know I just missed seeing that. Is it like DVR? Can I reverse that feed to be able to see a few minutes before? Yeah. Is that possible to do that? It is. And we call that a pre-record buffer. So, okay. you know, that buffer is configured. So typically what we'll see with like city owned cameras, you know, they'll keep the buffer for a few days and sometimes okay. businesses will only share live video. Other times they may share live and maybe some pre-record buffer that they're comfortable with. A lot of times that's three or four days. But, you know, when you talk about incidents that are unfolding in real time, you really aren't talking about needing data a week in the past or a month right. in the past, more of a forensic right. activity. What we're talking about is real time access right. to data. And during that real time access, I'm sure there's data showing up on the screens. It's almost like sci fi, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like it's almost like what you see going on, you know, near future type stories. And there may be data on there because some of these cameras may be license recognition, plate readers, and stuff. So with that, they could pull that up as well at that moment. So cars passing by, they're following it down the line. Beyond just pulling up the license plate reader, think about pulling that up in context with surveillance video. So now you know where the vehicle was at the time. So mm -hmm. now you have a time mark where you can pull up the closest available live surveillance feed and you're seeing both in concert. Think right. about how officers would have responded to that in the past. They would have actually physically gotten in their car driven to a location that they hoped that a suspect would drive past. Now they're using what we consider to be more of an intelligence-led policing approach. Mm -hmm. And that not only helps them do their job, but it also makes best use of taxpayer funds, right? Because now you're mm -hmm. not just throwing personnel resources at a challenge. You're actually using technologically enhanced response oh, mechanisms. Yeah, absolutely. And I think I could go further and just say that I think that if they're following someone down the road, instead of ending up being a police chase, a car high-speed chase somewhere that actually can be ahead of where they're going almost throughout the chain and blow out the tires. I mean, and we're talking about cars, but it could be someone on foot as well to be able That's to right. see where they're going if they fled the scene. More eyes on the street, if you will, to allow yeah. other surveillance to be enhanced with what they're doing, like you said. So, I mean, I see a lot of possibilities. Now, to dig in a little bit more, you know, we talked about privacy before. Facial recognition is part of what a lot of people know about, right? Because right. your iPhone can recognize you. You know, right. it'll open an app based on in your face. And it almost doesn't matter what you're doing sometimes unless you're doing like a blow-up face. And it might not recognize you, right? But using AI, using machine learning, being able to recognize that, is that necessarily part of what you're doing? It could be done later, but it's also used for identification as well, no? Yeah, so artificial intelligence is kind of a broad term, and it gets thrown around quite a bit. 
you know, at Fusis, we kind of simplify that. So when we talk about what we've built, you know, we have data scientists on our team, our research and development team. And what these data scientists do is they basically identify the fact that you have a white shirt on. I have a dark shirt on. And so if I'm looking in video for a missing person or an injured person and they're in a park and the 911 call comes in and that call says, well, this person's wearing a white shirt. That alone may take what is a thousand people in that park down to a hundred, right? So now you're by a large extent really making that area of focus more constrained and that helps them in a real time response scenario. Take that one step further, Rico, you're wearing a bag on your back, right? So mm-hmm. now 100 becomes maybe 10. And then we'll add in there that you have blue jeans on, for example. So now that 10 goes down to maybe two. And so artificial intelligence in our world is really just a way to kind of take what is a large, broad view of video and really mm-hmm. kind of funnel that into something that's actionable. Because you know, what you're looking at, Rico, you're dealing with human beings, right? And Mm -hmm. there's this concept of information overload. And so there's diminishing marginal returns, obviously, on investment. As you add more cameras in a city, you can't just stare at more cameras on a screen (laughs) and have a better idea of what's going on. It's inversely proportional, right? So what AI does is it's kind of the equalizer. It says, listen, these cameras are now smart and they act almost like an alarm. We're missing a child that was wearing a backpack with a white shirt and blue jeans. Mm-hmm. Now our cameras in the city of Peachtree Corners can look out for that missing individual and then signal mm-hmm. to the officers that, hey, we may have a possible match. And obviously that can make right. the difference between saving that child's life or them being taken out of the city limits. And that's obviously what we're trying to do. Right. And so for an individual to, to hear that, that doesn't just mean that they're looking at all the screens to say there's a child with a backpack. Literally, the system is recognizing that and will show those images on the monitor as the police are investigating it. That's exactly right. You know, the platform rollout that you're doing in Peachtree Corners is pretty much what we discussed just now, right? That first phase. So I imagine there's a second phase. So what would be involved in a second phase of of this? Well, I think right now that's kind of TBD, but expansion is really, you know, our area of focus. I mean, as we bring in more community businesses, you know, the network effects take hold, right? The value of the system to you and I as citizens of Peachtree Corners increases proportionate to the buy-in from the business community. You know, as more video sources and more alarms are put into the system, the Situational awareness of our West Precinct assigned Met County police officers improved. Mm -hmm. And as such, the thought process is their ability to provide us public safety improves as well. So phase two is really at this stage thought to be more of an expansion upon phase one. In phase one, we're looking at really developing kind of a critical mass of adoption. And I think we've identified some businesses, some areas of interest that we'd like to reach out to and encourage their participation. And then hopefully, obviously, bring solutions to, you know, issues that we're all aware of are now becoming more well-known in Peachtree Corners in terms of public safety. So that's where the rubber hits the road. Does the system help GCPD provide a better service to us as a community? And that's where, you know, I think we'll be keeping a close eye in phase one and making sure that our progress is measurable and defined. And then candidly, that that's something that, you know, as GCPD talks to members of the community through the COPS forum, that they can report, you know, when they have their COPS meetings. Not only GCPD, I mean, the system actually, because of the way the platform is set, not only can it use multiple different technologies, be drawn into different cameras and such, different operating systems, I guess, right? But you're talking across agencies too. So it's not, let's say something happens here, but all of a sudden that perpetrator is going into DeKalb or Fulton County or the city of Duraville or Brookhaven. If they're all wired within the system, there's really nowhere to hide to a degree, right? If you're a criminal. I mean, is that the goal to be able to do that? Yeah, Rico, we always say, you know, criminals don't know jurisdictions, right? They will transit from one jurisdiction and into another to commit a crime and then go back. And that may be the jurisdiction that they live and is different from the jurisdiction that they commit the crime. And so for years and years and years, technology was siloed. Camera A didn't speak to software B. 
or mm -hmm. software system A did not speak to software system B. And what Fusus has done is we've eliminated that. We basically created bridges between all of these disparate systems so that, among other things, law enforcement agencies can have inter-department collaboration. They call that mutual aid. And when you're talking about catching criminals and people doing the wrong thing, or even when you're talking about responding to a life safety situation, an ambulatory situation where maybe the closest available law enforcement or emergency resource is actually in a neighboring jurisdiction, that's where this inter- agency collaboration through FUSIS is so powerful. And we're seeing it all over the country. I mean, we've got now 120 plus cities and counties around the country that are connected, some very large cities, some entire mm -hmm. state. Just here in the Atlanta metropolitan area, we have a wealth of mutual aid opportunity. You've got obviously the city of Atlanta using the system, Cobb right. County, Fulton County, Sheriff's Office, Henry County, Roswell, Alpharetta. I mean, so you've got a veritable gold mine, if you will, of collaboration. And that's what FUSIS endeavors to do. You know, obviously, Peachtree Corners has invested in a certain number of cameras, both license plate readers and surveillance cameras mm -hmm. in town center and otherwise. But you think about maybe call it 150 cameras. Think about the 10,000 now that, to your point, Rico, our friends over at Gwinnett County through the system can utilize to kind of put the pieces together in an emergency. And that's what FUSIS does. Yeah, interestingly enough, I think if people knew the range of technology being used by different cities, different counties, different departments, where they don't meet each other, even within a federal government doing welfare, let's say, or Medicaid or Medicare, it took a while for some of these agencies to be able to talk to each other. Right, because yep. they're using completely different platforms, completely different technology, and it's no different in law enforcement, right? That's right. So being able to have a platform like yours, to me, just makes sense. And you're then now the power of what you're doing here across counties, because like you said before, I mean, criminals don't know jurisdictions. They might be in Fulton County and they might go up to Calhoun for the weekend right. or something. You know, I mean, anything's possible. Peachtree Parkway is a thoroughfare going from Midtown, going all the way up to Johns Creek and Forsyth. I mean, you can make that drive over 40 minutes, depending on the time of day, right? And things can happen and random things can happen as people know. So you have, when people do burglaries, right? I think it was in Midtown Street just recently. There was like 20 car break-ins on the same street. It was just a ridiculous amount of break-ins. But people think a criminal would break into one car. Well, no, they're not there for one car. They're in a parking deck and they're going to go to five or six or seven different cars because that's how they make their money. That's right. So if, if police can see that happening, because it could happen over a period of 40 minutes and mm -hmm. no one would know. Right? right, But if police can see that, I mean, I can see how that is a benefit. And when you get someone like that off the street, that means there's less of that happening because that's not the only time that's happening. Right. Well, and criminals also know a hard target versus a soft target. So if mm -hmm. the word gets out that Peachtree Corners is interconnected, that we have a public-private partnership between the business community and law enforcement, that right. there's free flow of information sharing and as such rapid response from law enforcement – you know, they're going to go somewhere else. The, the word will get out very quickly. They're not going to be breaking into cars, breaking into businesses with the same level of frequency that perhaps they did prior to that engagement with the community. And that's why if you look across the country, Rico, this is the future of law enforcement. It's not just mm -hmm. something that's unique to Peachtree Corners. Community-led policing is really, if you talk about what the buzzwords are in public safety today, community-led policing is probably at the forefront of the conversation. And it's not just law enforcement. I mean, the mayors are actually running on community-led policing efforts. And it just makes sense, right? I mean, you're saying, listen, we're going to make better use of taxpayer funds. We're going to bring the business community, members of the community, in closer collaboration with law enforcement. And what that does, Rico, is it builds trust, yeah. right? I mean, that's yeah. fundamentally what we're achieving here is that now with quicker response and better collaboration, members of the community become part of the solution. And we all know change management, right? If you're trying to change the perception of public safety, get people actively involved in the change. And so that's what yes. we're doing. Uses. And that's great. Cause I think you brought up the Floyd incident from a few years ago. Transparency is probably right. the biggest thing. Right. Uh, more cameras mean more transparency, not only 
in, in the situation of law enforcement, but also to make sure that law enforcement also acts responsibly because they're all within the system. It becomes an important factor, I think, like you said, for that trust. And I can only see it growing because there will be more cameras. There will be more use. And I'm sure as your company evolves, there'll be more different uses that you may not have realized today that may come up 12 months from now. Because with more activity, I think that creates more opportunities for advancing the system that you have. So as far as Pastry Corners goes, maybe you can, you know, you guys have been in Pastry Corners, I don't know for how long, but why did you choose to put your company here? First off, I live here. Okay. (laughs) The second thing is that I really liked when I was looking at where to set up our headquarters, because we did look outside of Pastry Corners as well. You know, candidly, you think about hiring a lot of engineers, people that are fresh out of Georgia Tech, perhaps, you think immediately, okay, let's go Midtown, right? Because that's, right. you know, you've got Tamarta, you know, available, and that's just mm-hmm. accessible. But what I really loved about Peachtree Corners is, first off, it was a very friendly community in terms of business. They were very supportive of us, the mayor and the city manager, Mike and Brian, you know, they were right. very supportive of us setting up shop here. It's also very technologically forward-leaning city. And if you look at what Brian's done, it's just tremendous. I mean, he has really put, you know, this is kind of the Silicon Orchard. It's kind of the East Coast equivalent, if you will, of the Silicon Valley. You know, you've got a lot of companies coming here that are in the technology sector. You've got autonomous vehicle companies. You've got the 5G initiatives that Brian's been pushing forward. You've got the International Technology Collaborative that he's mm-hmm. created with countries like Israel. And so if you think about where you want to be as a technology company and where a wealth of talent will potentially locate themselves, well, yeah. Peachtree Corners is a great place. So we've had a lot of success here. I would also tell you that the building owner for the building that we're in, he was great to us. You know, when we started Rico back in June of 2019, we had five employees. And as a new company with five employees, and we had a fold-out table. That was our conference table, right? Oh, that's funny. And you know, all of us left good-paying jobs and really kind of, you know, on a hope and a prayer, right, to make our own company. And so the building owner was <laughs> very kind to us when I said, "Listen, I can't sign a long lease, and it's got to be a very reasonable monthly rate." But we wanted to be in a nice building because we had confidence that we could, you know, sure. if we put our heads together, we could grow something. And sure enough, Bud was really kind in giving us kind of a a no lease space to rent. And now I'm happy to report that I'm his largest tenant and we have a hundred employees and growing and we did it in a little over two years. And so pretty excited about where we are, but, you know, even more excited about where we're going. Excellent. It's good to have you here. And you're right, Brian, and the city has done such a terrific job. I think there are 20 countries represented here between companies like Valmet, that's I think out of Finland, agencies and chambers like the French American Business Chamber that's located here, and companies like Intuitive Robotics that just is building out their five building campus. I mean, I, I don't think people understand to some degree that lived here for a while, how much is represented within the city. So cutting edge, having companies like yours here really has made a difference here. And certainly, I'm looking forward to the difference it can make in community safety. It's good to have you on. I appreciate, Chris, your time with us. Everyone, if you're you know, looking, obviously, for additional information, where can they find additional information on your company? Rico, we'll have the connectpeachtreecorners.org website. We'll have that up and running here soon. And okay. we'll have contact information and all sorts of ancillary data. So people are trying to learn more about the opportunity and how to contribute and how to participate please take a look at that website. And we're, of course, here, Fusis and Peachtree Corners, and they can always reach out to us directly at fusis.com. And we look forward to supporting the city. This is our home. This is where my family lives. This is where our children go to school. And so, you know, obviously I have a vested interest in making sure that, you know, this program is successful and that we take care of our fellow citizens in Peachtree Corners. So thanks for having me on, Rico. Sure. I appreciate it, Chris. Thanks for being a good neighbor. Everyone, thanks again for joining us on this Peach Recorders Life podcast. Look out for our next issue of Peach Recorders Magazine and our newest Southwest Gwinnett Magazine. That will be coming out in the next month or so. But stay safe and have a great day.
Thanks for listening to Peachtree Corner's Life with Rico Figliolini. You can listen to the show wherever podcasts are found, like iHeartRadio, Spotify, and Apple Podcast. Leave us a review too. It helps others find the show as well. Don't forget to like our Facebook page and YouTube channel for notifications of our live simulcast video streams of the show. Catch our other podcast shows at livinginpeachtreecorners.com. In fact, you can listen to our other popular show, The Capitalist Sage, a twice-a-month podcast about and for businesses. The show brings you interviews with business owners, leaders, and subject matter experts. Find what you need to meet today's challenges that every business owner faces. Check out the show at thecapitalistsage.com. 